Hey, welcome, everybody, to the Non Sequitur Show. Um, today is going to be just Dave and I. Unfortunately, Kyle is busy with other things. He's switching internet providers, so he no longer has that robotic thing that's been going on as the last couple of weeks. So hopefully the new internet net provider will alleviate their problems. So he's resolving that tonight. So it's just going to be us tonight talking about black holes with Dr. Philippe Goikovic. But before we get into that, uh, coming up on the Non Sequitur Show, tomorrow we actually got uh, David uh, uh, pa Pac-Man with us. We've got uh, 9-11 Truther on Wednesday. We got Isseth, the original, that's Logic's wife on Thursday, and Tim O'Neill and Jesus on Friday. Now, we don't have Jesus, but he'd be talking about Jesus. So, no, we're not bringing Jesus on the show, although that would be a hell of a guest. Um, if we ever find a way to get in contact with Jesus, we'll see what we can do to arrange it. But I'm sure his schedule is pretty busy. So, anyways, Dr. Philippe Goikovic, you might remember, had, uh, had a discussion slash debate with Dr. Hugh Ross uh, a couple months ago, and he's black, and he's going to be talking about supermassive black holes, not just like micro black holes, but the big kind, like Sagittarius A and the ones that exist in the heart of galaxies. So welcome back, Dr. Goikovic. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Well, we missed you. It was We, we liked, we, we liked the, the talk last time, and we love things like black holes. I don't know why, but everybody seems to have a fascination with dinosaurs and black holes. You can't get away from them. Every, everybody. It's like growing up, the kids are fascinated by dinosaurs, but they're also fascinated by this concept of an object that is so massive that light cannot escape. So we, we, I guess yeah. you have a presentation for us, right? I do, I do. I have a small presentation, which is not small. Probably I'm going to be talking a lot. <laughs> I tend to do that. Sorry. Well, that's quite fine. Um, what we're going to do is we we do have a time crunch today. Uh, we have to finish this within 90 minutes. So as the super chats come in, if you don't mind, I'm going to be reading them in real time if possible, because they might have some questions pertinent okay. to what you're talking about. No problem. So I think that we're going to jump right into it. And if Dave wants to kind of start up the presentation, we can dive right into it. Okay, so yeah, good uh, Good afternoon, I think is for you, is it? It yeah. is, it is actually literally <laughs> noon right now, like noon. Okay, so good afternoon everybody. Uh, so my name is Felipe Goikovic, I'm originally from Chile, but I live in Germany. I'm a, I have a PhD in astrophysics from uh, with a double degree from your from one university in Chile and one in Germany. And I want to clarify, uh, after the debate, people was, were commenting that I had two uh, PhDs, and that's not true, I have one, but it's from two universities. So it's not exactly not the same thing. Uh, so I have, my, I have my PhD since a little bit over a year now, and now I'm a a postdoctoral researcher, and actually, I very recently, one month ago, I started a new position here at Heidelberg and Heidelberg University. To, uh, but I switched topics. Um, I'm going to be working with uh, planetary systems instead of black holes. So, yeah, don't be disappointed. That, uh, no, just now I'm, <laughs> I am deviating my attention towards uh, this other type of systems. They're actually pretty similar to, to the ones the, the ones we model with black holes. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about black holes in astrophysics, and I I am trying to emphasize in the in astrophysics in the sense that I'm going to try to do an overview of the role of uh, these objects in the in actual in the actual uh, study of uh, of after astrophysics, not not as much as the physics point of view, not the hardcore uh, general relativity equations, but more like what phenomena we observe uh, from these objects. So if you go to the first slide, to the, the next slide, please. So yeah, uh, of course we have to start with uh, understanding uh, what a black hole is to start our discussion. And for that, we need to first understand the, the, uh, the nature of, of gravity. As you might know, uh, after the general relativity theory from Albert Einstein, we understand now that gravity is a geometric effect from the deformations in space-time from, uh, from masses. 
So for example, in this image, we observe, for example, the space-time around different objects. We have the sun, uh, and around the sun, we observe this curvature that is kind of, let's say, mild, compared, for example, a white dwarf that is more dense. And if you go to a denser object, a neutron star, you have more curvature. And the, the extreme, extreme, is a black hole. So a black hole, uh, by definition, is the region of space-time where nothing can escape. That's the most basic definition, and that uh, it's all, all what a black hole is. And something that I want to clarify, because there was a discussion the other day in the discourse, uh, the discourse server that you have, uh, the black hole is not the singularity. So the description of a black hole has a singularity in the center, but that is not a physical object. Uh, it says that, uh, the, the theory says that in, in the singularity, all the mass of the black hole uh, is contained and it has zero volume. That's why some people were arguing that an object, a physical object cannot uh, exist with zero volume, hence black holes don't exist. But while black <laughs> holes are not, are not the singularity, black holes are the region uh, around this singularity, is this uh, region of extreme uh, curvature. Uh, so if you go to the next, next slide, please. So this is basically a very rough sketch, uh, very useful. I don't know if I, the resolution here is not very good. I, I don't know if um, it, it actually will be much clearer on the outside. Um, the internal okay. that we're looking Great. at is low res to save on bandwidth. There we go. That's what they'll actually okay. be seeing on the much clearer. Okay. Good. So. Good. good. So yeah. So from top to bottom, we have different. Uh, let's say. Uh, well, this is a, a diagram of space-time, very common. So you have in one uh, in one axis space, and the other axis you have time. Uh, in these cones that you observe is the the casual. Uh, the, the cone basically is casually, casually connected to the rest of the universe. So basically this cone is defined by the speed of light because that's the, the highest speed that any object can go. Uh, so if you go closer to the black hole, these lines start to deform. And if you, and if you go past the event horizon, which is the, the region that defines the black hole, all these uh, lines, the, the, what I call future lines, point now towards the center of the black hole, so towards the singularity. So if you go past the event horizon, uh, as, at most you can stay, if you go to the speed of light, you can go, uh, you can stay at the same distance from the, from the center. Now uh, the, this would but, be like the, uh, the top, this would be the top of a light cone, right? It's not showing the, the, the past lines. This is just the future lines of a light cone. The future sure. line, exactly, exactly. So only the future line. So all the future lines are either going to the center or keeping the same distance. But you cannot go back, basically, because the 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 the, the curvature of the space time is so extreme that it, it curves towards the black hole. In so there's, once, there's, there's no there's no timeline that will actually take you outside of that event horizon. Once you're in there, exactly. all all lines go to the towards the singularity. Eventually. Exactly. So basically, the event horizon is a one dimensional membrane. Once you go through, you cannot go back. So it's only one, one direction. Uh, uh, so, another thing that I wanted to clarify uh, black holes are not vacuum cleaners. Uh, black holes don't really suck matter. Uh, black holes is just actually uh, just a, a physical object for its a very Illustrative example is if you if you have the sun for for some let's say crazy process just uh, transform into a black hole suddenly uh, other than well we don't have any more light but uh, other than that the the the, the Earth can uh, continue this orbit uh, happily without changing anything because the space time very far from the black hole is indistinguishable. But, uh, but it wouldn't remain its own size, right? If, if the sun instantly became a black hole, it would be about three kilometers, right? In radius? Yeah, yeah exactly. Three kilometers. So it would be much smaller, so but the same amount of mass. Extremely small. Yes. Three kilometer radius. Okay. But the orbit of the Earth is going to remain exactly the same. 
it's not going to change at all because for to feel relativistic effects you need to be uh, closer to the to the charge radius so black holes do not suck that's that's a very common phrase that I've they heard don't suck times. no see they don't suck mm -hmm. we like black holes black holes yeah. don't suck <laughs> So they are just uh, just a mass, basically. But the very close, you have extreme deformations, extreme curvature of space-time. Uh, so that's very important to clarify. So uh, in order to produce a black hole, you, you need such high densities that these objects represent the, um, the final stage of gravitational collapse. So uh, these objects are very important to study uh, gravity in ex very extreme conditions because it's gravity working over time. That's as I've heard some places. So, so yeah, that's basically what a black hole is. So now I want to give a little bit of story about the concept of black holes and just mentioning uh, some of the some names that are, are important in defining the concepts that we know today. So if you go to the next slide, please. So first we have uh, John Mitchell and Pierre Limon, uh, Simon Laplace that in the 18th century were the first ones to basically come up with a, with a concept similar to what we know now as black holes. Uh, in particular, Mitchell uh, uh, published this concept of dark stars uh, because uh, the, the corpuscular theory of light from Newton was already out and it was accepted. Uh, they thought, okay, if you have a, a, a very massive star, that uh, so, so massive that the escape velocity is gonna be uh, higher than the speed of the light, and then you cannot see these stars. So they call, they, they call this dark stars. Of course, this is in the context of Newtonian gravity. Uh, and this is not really, it was just uh, like a, a con conceptual thing, not really, uh, not really something that it was expected to occur. So next, the next slide, uh, we have a very important guy. You probably heard of his name, uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, came up with his, his uh, general relativity, uh, in which he basically changed uh, our perception of uh, what gravity is. Before we had uh, gravity being a force, interaction between two objects Newtonian gravity you have two objects separated by some distance you they will feel an attraction but now uh, came Einstein and said no uh, this is not really a force it's just a geometry effect because of the curvature of space-time and in, in this free framework the framework of general relativity it was possible to continue to, to study uh, the uh, effect uh, to understand basically gravitationally collapsed objects, for example, uh, that include black holes, but also include uh, white dwarfs and neutron stars. So next is Carl Schwarzschild, that he was after. No, don't go. Don't go to the slide yet. So the, 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 this guy, Carl Schwarzschild, uh, he right after. Einstein published his th uh, theory of relativity. He came up with the with a solution for a uh, uh, for the gravitational field around a uh, stationary spherical uh, non-rotating mass, uh, what is called the Schwarzschild metric. And this is very used to this, uh, very well uh, spread to to describe the space-time around uh, black holes that are not rotating. So now the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> we have Finkelstein, that he was the first, because uh, when Churchill published his uh, his solution of the Einstein equations, uh, they realized, uh, I think it was Eddington and someone else, they realized that uh, there was a singularity in the radial coordinate, uh, but this singularity was not uh, an actual singularity, a physical singularity, was uh, just a product of the coordinates. And it was Finkelstein that uh, described this, this singularity as the event horizon, uh, what we know now as the event horizon, this one, di uh, one directional membrane uh, that objects can go only in one direction. 
So uh, then uh, in the 60s, we had CARE that came up with a solution similar to Churchill, but now around rotating, a rotating object, a rotating, for example, black hole. Uh, in the next slide. So we have Newman, that he it was the one that uh, uh, published a, a, like the full solution for now including a charge at this uh, rotating mass. So the, the, the solution of Newman is usually called the Kerr-Newman uh, metric. So it's the gravitational field around uh, charge and rotating masses or, or black holes. And the final guy I have here is John Wheeler, that he was the one that attributed to have uh, made public, let's say, the, the, the concept of black hole. He was the first one that used it uh, in a lecture, I think. And after that, it, this concept was like widespread to not only uh, the scientists, but also to the public. So this concept was used before, I think, in some other context, but he was the first one that made it widespread. So thanks to these guys and, of course, more, we have the, the concept that uh, we are familiar now uh, uh, of black holes. So now it's a good, it's a good time to mention what is called the no hair ther theory. Uh, so if you go to the, to the next slide. So uh, the solution of uh, Newman, so the Kerr Newman metric, uh, describe uh, the field around rotating and charged uh, black holes. And that's what is called like the full solution. And why is that? Because there's the, in, in general relativity, there's this the theorem that is called the no, the no hair theorem, which basically says that black holes are completely, if, uh, can be completely described by three parameters, mass, uh, spin, or rotation. Uh, and charge. So if you have those three uh, uh, three parameters, you can describe fully uh, a black hole. For, uh, that might sound strange to general public, but for example, if you think of a star, like the sun, for example, to, to fully describe the sun, you need basically many, many parameters, mass, radius, temperature, uh, get, metallicity and so on and so forth. You need many, many uh, parameters to describe one single star. But black holes actually, despite being very extreme objects, are extremely simple. You can describe it by three, um, just three parameters. Uh, and this is very interesting because uh, basically you cannot distinguish a black hole made of stellar material or something else. If you compress any matter and you turn it into a black hole, it's indistinguishable. If it has, of course, the same, exactly the same uh, three parameters, it's indistinguishable from, uh, from each other. So yeah, that's uh, something very interesting. So think, I, don't, I don't know if people are familiar with this, that despite black holes being so fascinating, are ex actually extremely simple objects. Is there, is there any way to determine Informational wise, I suppose like there's a uh, this star that collapses in a black hole, and there's other type of star that collapses in a black hole. What the original star was? Is there any information that's conserved in the system for whatever goes in the black hole? We can determine what it was that went in at all. Yeah, I'm not I'm not well equipped to answer that question. Actually, uh, I think that was one of the main topics of uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, his research, yeah, yeah, exactly. His research was about this kind of loss of information, and he uh, made this whole theory about uh, keeping some information at, at the level of the heaven horizon. But this is like hardcore physics, and I'm I, I don't think it's really resolved. Not, yet. No, 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 it's not. No, it's not resolved. Nobody really knows yeah. what what happens to that information. It's it's really weird because if you if it's kind of like violating some loss of physics, basically. You are losing some information. But probably it's because uh, uh, general relativity is not really a complete theory. It's, it's actually an amazing theory, and it's been able to, to predict things like that, that we can detect today, like gravitational waves. 
and it's extremely powerful, but it's, it's clearly incomplete. Uh, the, the singularity in the center of a black hole, that's a, the strongest indication that this, uh, this uh, theory is not, it's, it's, let's say it's incomplete. We need it, it, it needs more, uh, it needs to include more effects in order to be a complete theory. So it's probably like a, a wrong theory in the sense that it cannot be used to describe whole, the whole uh, different scales in the universe, only some scales. So if you go to very, very small scale where quantum effects are important, then general relativity breaks down. Yeah, I think I uh, but that doesn't mean... Go sorry? Ahead. Go ahead. I'll go ahead and finish. I, I, I just, just have a good question from the audience, I think. Okay, no, I just wanted to say that uh, that doesn't mean that a general relativity cannot be used. It's, very, it's a very elegant theory and it's clearly correct that the scales that is uh, that has been proven to work and in the same sense that Newton theory, it's a perfectly, perfectly uh, acceptable theory in the day-to-day -day life uh, as we experience gravity. But we know that it's, it's not, cannot be used to describe, for example, the gravity field around the sun uh, or it, well, more more massive objects like neutron stars, white dwarfs, and black holes. Now, now you can... Okay, the question is, is, do black holes contain dark matter as well? That's actually a good question. Nobody really knows if... if well, because we don't know what dark matter is, uh, we don't know if there, there are actually matter going inside uh, black holes, that this dark matter going inside black holes. It, it might be de depending on on the nature of the, that dark matter. But we don't know we don't know yet what is dark matter. Actually, there's uh, I was gonna say it later, but I think I can bring it up now. It's very interesting that now because of LIGO discoveries, the frequency of events. It's been so high that uh, if some people is thinking, are thinking that uh, probably black holes are more common than we thought. Because at, the, at first, when we discover uh, uh, the, the presence of this matter that we couldn't really see, the dark matter, uh, there was, of course, the, some hypothesis that it was black holes. But many people argue that it was it wasn't enough time to produce as many black holes needed to pro to actually explain the effects that we were seeing. So it was discarded. But now, because uh, there is there's been so many events detected by LIGO, there's been some people saying that maybe black holes can be the dark matter. Um, well, they, they would be the primordial matter that we're looking for. Right. I mean, if, if yes, we're seeing exactly. dark Probably matter, primordial. they would be primordial. But how would these primordial black holes have been around for so long? How were they not evaporated by now? It depends on the mass. That's... Well, you have, uh, yeah, you have, uh, you, if it's massive enough, it doesn't evaporate that fast. Yeah, but it's, well, we don't know the nature of dark matter. So I think that's uh, interesting, an interesting thing that is being actually discussed right now in the community. So. So yeah, where was I? Uh, no hair. No hair. Yeah, we finished with the no hair, and yeah. So let's go to the next slide. So yeah, after all these works by these the people, the this is basically the first time that we detected something that could be explained by black holes. Uh, Despite all these solutions and things that uh, I described before, people were really uh, saying that black holes were like a kind of a mathematical curiosity, like uh, a product of the solving the equations, but not really something that it was uh, in, in reality. But these objects, uh, the what we call the X-ray binaries, uh, could uh, actually be explained by the presence of an accreting black hole. So this is Cygnus X1, and it's basically a blue giant star that we observe to be moving, so it's rotating. And also we observe it to be very deformed, and it's deformed because of the extreme gravity of the companion. And also there is a, comp uh, a component of X-ray emission 
that cannot be explained solely by the, the, the star emission. So if you model the, the accretion disk around a black hole of a certain mass, I don't really remember actually the mass now, a few, a few solar masses probably, uh, then you can explain uh, this X-ray emission. For example, in the in this plot on the right, we have this is basically the distribution of energy at a very narrow uh, narrow window where you can you can see this uh, this peak is uh, is produced by uh, by iron emission and this is ionized iron and for that you need a very strong uh, very high temperature and that can only be uh, produced by a, by a extremely compact object so probably a black hole. So the observations, observations from this, uh, this system was the first evidence that black, hole, black holes actually really existed in our universe. And was this based so upon this what like, we had predicted? Is this where we, when we said, okay, if, if we were to discover a black hole and if it was having a companion star, we would expect to see these types of x-rays. Is, is, is that how they went about saying, oh, hey, these yeah, are the x-rays we expect. Like that. These are what we see, therefore it confirms what we would expect to see if a black hole Yeah, I, I, I don't know really the, the order of events, but I would say it's more the other way around. It was probably detected. And then say, uh, people started to calculate the, what kind of uh, uh, process you need to produce this high, very uh, energetic emission. And they realized that they needed like uh, this very, um, um, tight orbits around a very compact object. So they probably modeled that and say using this, uh, the space time around black holes. And they say, okay, this is the emission that we expect from, uh, from material uh, falling into a black hole. And, uh, and actually it can explain perfectly the, the observations that we see. Gotcha. Uh, so this is a, as good a time as any to start talking about how can we detect black holes. So basically, uh, so if, if we go to the next slide, so basically the question is if black holes don't really uh, emit light, uh, and I'm gonna do a disclaimer right away because I know people in the comments are gonna start like, ah, what about Hawking radiation? Uh, yeah, Hawking radiation exists, it's a real thing, but it's very, very small and it's, it's essentially undetectable from, from Earth, from any black hole. So it's, it's irrelevant in astrophysical context. So it, it, in practice, black holes don't really, uh, don't really need any light. So they are, if, if, if black holes are not interacting with anything, they are basically undetectable. Uh, so in order to detect, uh, we can detect black holes by the gravitational influence that they exert uh, in the surroundings, basically. Um, and binary systems, uh, including a black hole, can be ex uh, sources of extremely uh, high energies. And, and by binary systems, I just meant a black hole and something else orbiting the black hole. For example, one of the most important processes to produce energy around black holes, what is called accretion, so accretion of gas. So for, this is a, an, an artist's rendition of an accretion disk about a black hole. And basically, uh, in order for the gas to go from certain distance to inside the black hole has to lose some energy. And this means that a roughly 10% of the rest mass of this gas is converted in energy in order to go from point A to point B you need to lose this energy, and that is emitted. And in this 10% of rest mass being converted to energy is extremely efficient. Actually, for example, nuclear fusion, uh, which is another process of pr producing energy that we know inside the stars, for example, is less than 1%. So this is a very uh, efficient mechanism to produce energy from mass. So basically when matter is falling to a black hole, usually it has some angular momentum. So it's, it's not falling straight radially towards the black hole, it has some, some rotation around the black hole. So it settles into a disk and this disk starts to fall into 
deeper into the potential well of the black hole and it starts to hit to heat up and then this gas uh, falls to the black hole by emitting its energy uh, and because the very these black holes uh, uh, are very compact very dense uh, the the amount of energy needed to lose uh, that the material needs to lose is very high so you, pr you produce a huge amount of energy by this process uh, so this is one of the most important uh, methods for producing energy around black holes but also if you go to the next next slide you have something uh, that you are probably very familiar with by now gravitational waves so if you this is an animation so if you put uh, if you press play please so basically using mm -hmm no play here but that would normally be rotating and they would be going out from those no. two or orbiting <laughs> center yes <laughs> yeah the, this this is not uh, the most interesting uh, animation but i have some that are really awesome actually animations from my work uh, no never mind let's let's continue so basically after the the publication of the of general relativity uh, Einstein realized that he, if he linearized some of its uh, field equations, he get he got these uh, uh, these perturbations that uh, were carried away uh, at speed of light that he called gravitational waves or gravity waves. Uh, that that was produced by uh, by variation uh, variations in the mass quadrupole uh, moment of the object. So you need not only an accelerating object, you need a quadrupole. So if you accelerate like this in a line, you don't produce uh, gravitational waves. But if you, if you, for example, have a binary of two objects, uh, this is this has variations in the quadrupole moment, so they emit gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves uh, spread. Uh, throughout the universe and uh, something very interesting that because uh, is, these are deformations in space-time they don't really interact with the rest of uh, uh, the rest of the objects that in, they encounter so basically they remain uh, unchanged from the moment of emission towards for example when we detect them on earth so if you go to the next, next slide uh, so this is how the uh, detection of gravitational waves is it's made uh, uh, on Earth uh, using LIGO, which, which, is, which is the La Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, basically, we, uh, what it is, is uh, in an, an interferometer that has these uh, two arms, very long arms, uh, four kilometers each, that has uh, have this laser uh, yeah, that is split in two that go all the way to the to the extreme to the extreme of the arms and then go back and recombine in this uh, in this mirror and observe and th this creates a very particular pattern uh, of interference uh, of the light and because if you have gravitational waves passing through this uh, deforms space-time in between the arms so these arms are stretched and compressed uh, alternatively, so uh, this changes the uh, the interference pattern uh, observed in the in the last part of the this interferometer. So then we can detect the, the what is called the strain of the uh, of the gravitational wave that is passing through Earth, uh, which is just the the let's say change in the arm the the arm's length of this of this uh, observatory and if you go to the next slide uh, this is the first detection so this is the object that it was detected in 2015 uh, and i put the beginning of a, a new era because i cannot stress enough how important this discovery was to to uh, Current science, uh, astrophysics, and physics. Uh, so actually, when I, this is the uh, basically what is called the waveform, uh, is this what is called the strain 
with just basically the change on of the arms uh, length on each on each of these uh, arms of the interferometer so this very particular uh, uh, waveform is produced by the merger of two black holes so on top of this plot there is the the measured uh, event and in the bottom is the the waveform expected from basically uh, simulations so, so some people uh, using numerical techniques and different uh, theoretical tools they solve uh, Einstein equa equations in a full uh, the, the, the full set of equations around a binary and they produce uh, this this waveform and if you put one on top of the other, they match almost perfectly. Uh, and I, as an, an anecdote, when I saw this, uh, that it was the, the first detection, and it, it, was, it, was, it had the perfect shape, uh, I was very uh, emotional because <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Uh, because I, I, this wave, I didn't this wave expect form, they, Do they predict this? The, the waveform that we see here, when they modeled this and they said, if we are going to see when two black holes collide, we're going to expect to see something along these lines and expect to see this type exactly. of waveform. And then they, exactly. they, this is actually one of the cases where they did model this. Um, and they said, if this is event is what we're looking for, this is what we need to compare it to. And this was perfect. I mean, it, I don't think they could have gotten a better um, fit between predictive yeah, and yeah, that's what they, what they, what they found. Is. I mean, it's confirmation. To, to definitely say it was confirmed is an understatement. Exactly. It was. This is awesome because it was exactly what, what it was expected. This kind of this kind of waveforms have, have been seen for for years. People working with uh, with uh, general relativity have been predicting these kind of things for years. But of course, because if you actually see the numbers of the strain, so ten to the minus twenty one. This is basically the the percentage of no not the percentage but the like the relative change in the the, the arm's length and it's extremely extremely small so ten to to the minus twenty one is a very 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 small number so it's twenty one zeros before the first one zero point zero 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 so twenty one zeros. And so we didn't uh, we didn't have the technology to detect these kind of things. We needed time to develop all this technology, and finally in 2015 it was possible to detect. And I didn't expect this waveform to look the first detection to be this 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 perfect this 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 clear this clear waveform as it was expected. Uh, so yeah, actually uh, this these waveforms are not only to to confirm that it's actually a gravitational wave. You can you can measure some of the characteristics of the system. You can measure uh, the the masses of the two black holes, the fi the final mass of the of the remnant. So, if you go to the next uh, uh, to the next uh, slide, please, we have uh, like the different uh, uh, stages of the merger that were detected in these different parts of the waveform. So, first we have the spiral. So the two objects are rotating, uh, are dancing, let's say, uh, around each other, around the center of mass of the system. But the gravitational waves take away some of the orbital energy. So they come closer and closer together. So this is called the spiral. They, and when they touch uh, each other, they start to merge. They form this kind of like a peanut that they're rotating. This is, of course, very, very short. If you see this, this is just less than one second. And when the two objects are, are just one, they, they, they go to the, what is called the ring down, which is basically when the black hole starts to accommodate itself to find the equilibrium. So you have all these stages. So phase the spiral, then the merger where the, the, the frequency increases, and then the ring down. So this was the prediction as well as the measure. Event. And they've found uh, numerous other so similar events, right? Yeah, this this was the first, but it, there's been several now. detected. Yeah, and I was saying it was very uh, actually it, it was 
more frequent than we thought at the beginning. Uh, we've been detecting a lot, a lot of these these events. So if you go to the next slide, I believe I have the. This is basically masses of the what is called the stellar graveyard. So the masses of the known stellar black holes. On the bottom, the, there's the the neutron cell, but these are not are not really that important. So you have on the bottom uh, the black holes that are detected in, in purple in uh, by the X-ray binaries. So this emission because you have uh, a, a black hole that is swallowing material from a star, basically. And also the in blue you have the events detected by LIGO. I don't know if this is actually updated to the last uh, event detected, but uh, this this can give you an idea of the black holes that are that have been detected, which masses. So we are this is the the trend is really clear. You have uh, uh, the X-ray binary black holes are less less massive than than the the ones that the binary detected uh, by black uh, by LIGO. Sorry. So you you don't only really have uh, kind of a bias because you are observing, of course, the most luminous events. So of course, the the, the amount of energy depends on the masses of two objects. So the more massive, the more energy you emit in gravitational wave. Uh, and of course, so you will tend to detect the most luminous events. So that's why you have can, can uh, LIGO detect masses. two. Can LIGO uh, detect new, two neutron stars colliding or two white dwarfs colliding? Yeah, actually, they, they did. Uh, very recently, I think it was November last year or something like that, they detected uh, two neutron stars merging. And nice. that's also really, really awesome because the problem with black holes is that uh, when they merge, you just see the gravitational waves. And because we have just two detectors, we cannot really know where the we have just a very a large strip in the sky where this event occurred but so we don't basically know exactly where it is in the sky but with neutron stars you produce also a, an electromagnetic component so you just see something uh, brighten up and that was the case with the neutron star merger that it was detected by by LIGO sort of recently and that's really awesome because that allows to measure some other processes that uh, occur. For example, in neutron star, you can measure the equation of state of the gas of the neutron star. You can detect some of the elements that were produced in the merger and so on and so forth. So it's, let's say, a more rich detection because you can, uh, and that's going to come up later for, for what I'm actually going to talk about with my work. But something that complements the gravitational wave observation, you can extract much more information of the event of the of the objects that are participating if you have an electromagnetic counterpart. And that sadly doesn't happen with these black holes because they don't emit they don't emit uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation unless there is some gas going around. But these the ones that we've been detecting with LIGO so far, we we haven't been successful detecting any sort of emission, any electromagnetic counterpart. So gotcha. that's sad, but what can you do? So yeah, let's, let's go now to the next slide. So what I've been talking about all this time, if you've been paying attention, is black holes with very low mass. And so if you distribute, uh, I put this uh, in this pl the, well, this plot uh, displays different compact objects, so white dwarfs and neutron stars. But I don't really care about those. But uh, if you if you look at black holes, we basically have three very distinctive regimes. So we have the stellar stellar mass black holes, so the order of the sun mass or tens of solar masses, more or less. Uh, it can be maybe up to 100, but no more than that. And these are the product, basically, of stellar evolution. Uh, the most massive stars, uh, as they evolve, um, the, the, the nucleus, the core, is com being compressed by the, the heavier elements that are being produced by the nuclear fusion. 
uh, and this is being compressed, 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 compressed at the, at, up to the point where this becomes a black hole. And this, of course, it has a few, a few solar masses, let's say 10 solar masses, for example. Uh, then we have what we call the intermediate mass black holes. So from thousand solar masses to hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands solar masses. But there is this question mark because basically we don't observe any black holes in this regime. The other black holes that we observe are the supermassive black holes. that have millions of solar masses or even billions or even thousands of billions of solar masses. So extremely, extremely massive. But this is very puzzling because we have these very distinctive regimes. So we have the very low mass black holes and the extremely massive black holes, but we don't have anything in the middle. We don't detect its intermediate mass black holes. It's been uh, hypothesized that these live inside, uh, for example, globular clusters. So there, there are some efforts to kind of detect these, these objects, but not really with much uh, success up to now. So we have these two regimes. And what I want to focus now is the, the, the higher end of this plot. So the supermassive black holes, so this is uh, what actually uh, I work on, or at least what I work doing my, my PhD thesis and the first part of my, of my, of my first postdoc. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, so the next one, because now I'm gonna talk about supermassive black holes. So before uh, we were talking about these stellar black holes and these, these stellar mass black holes, and these are basically in our galaxy. With these X-ray binaries, for example, they're all uh, in, our, in our galaxy or nearby. But uh, these supermassive black holes, in, on the other hand, are in other galaxies in the sense that uh, we observe them in the center of most galaxies at least the most massive the more massive of the more massive galaxies we are fairly confident that at least the most massive galaxies they all contain uh, supermassive black holes in their centers and this example this is a very cool example so on the left side we have a, a radio image that is taken from from earth of this galaxy ngc uh, 4261 uh, where we observe we have the galaxy and also we have this very clear uh, very collimated jets very uh, so these are high uh, energetic uh, uh, electrons that are being ejected from from this from this source producing this radio image uh, this uh, uh, radio emission that is uh, that comes from the, the very center so now if you go if you zoom in now, using, for example, the in this case, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, just zoom into the very, very center, you can actually resolve uh, a very clear disk. And this is thought to be the accretion disk around the supermassive black hole that is in the center of this galaxy. So these uh, black holes uh, are thought to be the engine of what we call uh, active galactic nuclei. So galaxies with a very, very luminous um, uh, core, a very luminous uh, nucleus. So uh, an active galactic nuclei or uh, AGNs, that's the, the nomenclature that we use usually. AGNs are the, these uh, active galaxies with a supermassive black hole that is eating material. So if you go to the next, uh, Slide. Oh, I let, let's try to play this because this is very cool animation. Please, 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 please. <laughs> I, I don't think that the format you sent him allows for playing yeah, well, animation. Yes, I, I, I wish I could play your keynotes. I really do because I know Keynote would have a play button and this would animate and it would look really uh -huh, cool. This is but I don't have Kino or a Macintosh, so no, this is, I can't do it. This is very disappointing. Now this is a bunch of bright points. 
So uh, I, my life is the, full of disappointment. So this is just one more to add to my list. Yes. But luckily, yeah. I've seen this animation before other places, or at least um, not yeah, even the animation, can, the actual real this. photos. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually yeah. These are the orbits uh, of the stars in the very very center of a galaxy. This is actually one of the uh, most robust measurements that we have for a black hole. Is in our what we call our backyard, so in the center of our own galaxy, uh, we have uh, these stars orbiting what is basically a black point or you know, something that is not really emitting. Uh, and because we can, uh, we have uh, the full revolution of many of these very close by stars. We can fit an orbit and actually calculate this, the the mass of the of the object that is inside. And this is around four million solar masses. So it's a let's it's in the lower end uh, of the masses of this supermassive black hole. So it's not very very massive, uh, but it's respectable. Uh, ah, that animation. That is. We do it this way. Yes, very... we'll do it this way. That work. Yes, ah, that, that's that. really cool. You see the middle. Yeah. We'll replay it there. Yes. Exactly. So the stars rotate in, uh, around this point that is marked by a, a white star. Of course, this white star is not uh, is not the actual thing. It's, in, it's just to, to mark the spot of the of the yep. of the all... center of these orbits. Yep. So this is one of the most compelling evidences evidence that we have for for. Uh, or a supermassive black hole is in the center of our own galaxy. I mean, there's, there's really no other explanation besides the fact there has to be something very massive there. And because we know there's something very massive exactly. there, it's a, it's a black hole. There's nothing really else it could be because of the fact that it's so much mass and such a small unit volume that it's going to have the, con the properties of not having the ability to have light escape from it, which is a black hole, right? Yeah, there are some papers uh, like hypothesizing that it could be something much more exotic, like a uh, boson star or something like that. But we, because we can we can actually observe black holes in other galaxies, we are fairly confident that this might be uh, a black hole. Because yeah, it's basically a, a Occam's razor. It's the most simple explanation. Right there you go. Yeah, uh, we, in in science, we n nothing is one hundred percent sure. Of course, it's just see somebody who actually gets the Occam's razor correctly for a change, right? Hey, Wot Voton, pay attention. This is how a scientist actually correctly correctly uses Occam's he's razor. Actually, he's actually in the live chat too. Believe it or not, Steve. He's you know what? He corrected earlier. himself the other night. He actually, I gotta give I gotta give uh, a Voton props. He actually agreed that he wasn't using it quite right, and he has since corrected that. So, her, you know, props to him. <laughs> well, our parsimony, I call so, it, yeah. whatever. <laughs> so yeah, we have this strong evidence for uh, a supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. So why these supermassive black holes are interesting? Uh, why, the, do, do they have any impact on anything in the, in the universe? So that's my next slide. Uh, actually, they, they seem that they are this is what we that is called the bulge uh, black hole relation. Uh, in this case, this is a uh, scheme depicting the mass of the central bulge of the galaxy. So this uh, like kind of a spherical uh, bunch of stars in the kind of the towards the middle of the galaxy, not the disk, but this uh, more spheric, spherical feature of the galaxy. So the mass of this the total of stars. Uh, against the black hole mass, and we observe this very, very clear relation. So the most massive galaxies have more massive black holes. And this is something that is an indication, because we have to think this. Even though these black holes are extremely massive, in the sense that it's just one object that has, let's say, 10 million solar masses, it's nothing compared to the mass of the galaxy. Uh, the mass of the galaxy is six orders of magnitudes uh, higher than that, or even even more than that. So, and 
Furthermore, these black holes are extremely, extremely small. Uh, just uh, a few parsecs of the more massive ones. Uh, we ha they, they have, they are really, really small because it's very concentrated uh, piece of material. So uh, how can you have this uh, kind of, uh, how to say, like uh, uh, symbiosis between the black hole, the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy? And this actually can be explained by, uh, by what we call AGN feedback. So AGN is the acronym from this active galactic nuclei, so galaxies that are active. When these black holes are accreting material, they uh, expel huge amount of energy. And this energy basically shapes the galaxy. Uh, and not only that, uh, also this uh, this energy also regulates the the amount of mass that is they can the, the, that the black hole can eat. So basically, some material falls uh, to the black hole. The black hole uh, starts uh, emitting energy, and this energy blows some of the some of the gas away. So basically, the black hole is uh, has this feedback relation with the material that is that is coming towards it, and this produces this very clear. Uh, correlation between the characteristics of the galaxy, which is extremely large, uh, and the black hole that is basically a point in the center of this galaxy. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I, I think I went a little bit ahead. Uh, this is basically a picture, uh, a depiction of what we think is happening uh, with this kind of uh, this feedback processes. So we have a uh, for example, radiative processes that basically the, 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 the energy from the AGN, so the, the black hole, is heating the material, and this creates this like, kind of a bubble that is expanding and is blowing this uh, cold gas uh, from the galaxy. This cold gas is the one that forms stars. So uh, that's why the, the, the mass of the the total mass of the galaxy is regulated by this uh, by this uh, these processes, and also the kinetics. So basically, blow blowing, so injecting momentum. Uh, this, if you produce, for example, a jet, and this also happens in the accretion process. So if you have you have this accretion disk around the black hole, and if this material is ionized, you can produce uh, some magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are twisted for the rota for, from the rotation of the material and the black hole. And this essentially produces these very collimated uh, jets uh, that expel energy in a very, uh, first in a very narrow way. And then when they reach lower density environments, they, they blow up in a bubble. And this starts heating up the, uh, the atmosphere of the galaxy. Uh, so that's why these black holes, even though they are really tiny, they can have a huge impact in the, in the history of, uh, uh, of galaxies. And then in the next slide, I had a really, really, really cool animation, but we are not going to be able to, to look at it. It's basically Which, a... This is actually a real, this is a real picture of a black hole. That's what it looks like right there. <laughs> Which <Black. laughs> <Black. laughs> What was the animation? Maybe I can pull it up online like the last one. Actually, actually, yes. I think I can find it. It's from the Illustris project, which is uh, uh, a very uh, state-of-the-art uh, cosmological simulation from, I think it's this one. Uh, no. Uh, and they basically what they, ah, yes, I found it. Yes. So where can I send the link? Uh, send it to Dave via his email that you were talking to to get the link yeah, to get yeah. in here. Yeah, I will send the link. Yeah, this is a very cool uh, animation of the, uh, of basically, well, I, I can explain now uh, what a cosmological simulation is. Uh, basically, uh, what uh, people working with, with theory or numerical techniques, what they do is to simulate a box of, that represents the 
portion of the universe and they put uh, dark matter in the form of just uh, some material that just interacts uh, with, uh, gravitationally with uh, other material uh, with certain uh, initial conditions that start forming these uh, filaments that we observe in the universe and inside these filaments the, it's where you form galaxies basically the gas that is yeah this very very cool uh, animation so in the left you have this dark matter this is the density of dark matter as you go uh, so on the bottom you have time since the big bang so if you go closer to uh, current times you start forming these filaments and they become denser and denser and in the center if you go to now to right where you see gas temperature uh, you have these nodes where basically galaxies are forming and once you form galaxies you form a black hole and these black holes start uh, accreting material and they start blowing up so you will start seeing some flickering and some very hot material being expelled and this is the action of black holes uh, in this kind of uh, cosmological context, so in a, in, a, in a simulation representing the whole universe. Uh, so these objects are extremely important. They, they are a key part in the galaxy formation process because of this, this, uh, this uh, the, the production of energy from the accretion of material. So where, when the galaxy is forming, you, you have some gas going to the center and this uh, go inside the black hole, this heats up and boom, starts to blowing up uh, a lot of hot gas uh, uh, to, to, the, to the surroundings. So yeah, the, this, so this is the kind of simulations that they, uh, they've been made in, the, in current times for, uh, trying to understand the characteristics of galaxy. Basically, it's galaxy formation. Uh, these are oriented to understand galaxy formation. And this, this supermassive black hole play, black holes play a very, very important role. Uh, so this is uh, another animation, but it's not really that important. So during this, the process of forming these galaxies, uh, the, the current, uh, the current, uh, paradigm that we have for formation of stru structures uh, uh, in the universe is the uh, is hierarchical. Basically, what it means is that the smaller uh, structures form first, and then these structures uh, merge to form larger structures. So that applies to galaxies. Uh, you start forming first the small galaxies, and you merge to form the, the galaxies that we observe today. So galaxy mergers are very um, uh, frequent in the, this, the history of the universe. You have two galaxies basically colliding and forming a new galaxy. So because we are convinced that two black holes, uh, the, the basically, so sorry, that mass in, massive, at least in massive galaxy, we have a black hole in the center. Uh, this is, it's bound to happen that uh, eventually two, uh, uh, galaxies will merge and they both will have a black, two supermassive black holes in their centers and they will uh, these black holes will start interacting with the with the material uh, around and to the, the material in the remnant galaxy and basically what is going to start to happen is that because you, they are very heavy uh, because the, the individual objects are very heavy compared, for example, to individual stars or gas or whatever it's around the galaxy, they will start to sink towards the, the center of the remnant. So if you go to the, to the next slide, I think we have, I, I put uh, like an schematic representation of, of, this, of this process. So you have the, the galaxies uh, collide, and these two black holes start interacting with the gas and stars around, and they sink towards the center of the remnant. Very in relatively large, uh, sorry, short time scales, so very very fast. Uh, and they uh, when they when they meet, they form a binary. So when they start um, feeling uh, the each other gravity, because at, at the beginning they are so separated that they just feel. The, the influence of the stars around them, but at some point the, the mass inside the orbit of the two black holes is less than the mass of the two black holes. 
So they will feel each other and they will uh, orbit uh, around each other. And that's what we call a supermassive black hole binary. Uh, and this is actually the topic of my PhD thesis, studying the, the evolution and formation of uh, gaseous structures around these supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, so this in this slide, I have this this representation of uh, this a simulation, uh, a hydrodynamical simulation of the merger of two galaxies, uh, two galaxies very similar to the Milky Way. Actually, this, the animation that I had before it was the like a simulation of the future collision between the Milky Way, so our galaxy, with Andromeda galaxy, because we know that they both are approaching. Uh, so ev eventually they will merge and form a very uh, massive elliptical galaxy. Uh, so this is the, a kind of simulation that shows that you have the, the collision of these two uh, galaxies. And in the end, if you zoom into the center, these two black holes are orbiting each other in, if, and forming a binary. Are you going to ask that? I think, no? I think someone wanted to ask something. Did we have a question in the live chat that we missed? I've been looking at it, but I didn't see any. I don't think so. Uh, if we do, I'll... So, yeah. So, yeah, the binary stage is what I, I'm interested in. And what is very uh, uh, challenging about this, if, if, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, what is challenging is that uh, I put just a sample of the candidates that we have. Uh, for these supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, and basically, most of them can be explained with uh, scenarios that even don't need uh, the presence of a, an actual binary. So we don't really have a very strong uh, observation of these, of these objects, even though we know that they're probably very frequent in our universe. Uh, we, we cannot observe them. And because uh, the, the scales that you need to resolve for that are really small. The, the separation of the two black holes when they become a binary, uh, it's it's really really small, and if they are not emitting, they are not uh, they're not active. Uh, basically, we cannot observe them. Observe them. Our best candidate for a binary is actually uh, uh, what we call a radio a dual core in radio, because basically two black, the two black holes are eating some material, so we can see the two black holes. So and resolve the, that they are really close. And this is the strongest candidate for, for a supermassive black hole binary. But there are very, very few candidates, which mean that uh, maybe they merge really fast. Uh, but uh, they, that can also mean that basically we still don't have the, the capabilities to, uh, to observe these objects. So these black and holes that's are important recently... because these black holes originally were very, very, um, they were important to the early formation of the universe. Do they still continue to provide a, a major significant thing to the how the universe actually um, continues to, to quote unquote evolve? Yes, the, the, um, this process is, um, continues to happen basically through, throughout the whole history of the universe. But there was a point of uh, where the galaxies were more more, uh, more active, and that's around Redshift two. If there, there there is a very famous plot that you you observe that, for example, the the star formation rate of, of galaxies as a function of, of the age of the universe is basically which is Redshift, and at at two you have a peak. So in this peak is where everything is happening basically you have a lot of gas going around uh, falling towards the center so you have a lot of formation of stars but also you have a, a lot of uh, black holes being active and expelling some gas away uh, so this is a process that is continuously it happens continuously but uh, because now you you have galaxies that are depleted from gas you have galaxies that are, are in the sense that are not not gonna not gonna be active unless there is something that a gas rich galaxy comes and and merges with them, this one this this gas poor galaxies so that's why we don't observe these objects uh, 
uh, really close by because they're more, much more rare. You observe them very, very fast where they were, basically everything was, was happening. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, now in that diagram there, where it has like the um, the two objects, and you have the the cross on it or the the plus sign, the, the uh -huh. black hole actually would be would be very 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 small as compared to everything else, right? I mean, it would be like the size yeah, of the so you could see it. Right? So those objects, that no, we're even, that, even that, less, yeah. middle, that's not the black hole. The black hole is 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 imperceptible. It's inside of there somewhere, correct? Exactly, it's extremely extremely small. The, the, what you, you observe there is the, this core, which is basically the gas being heated up, is the, the, the very hot gas that is uh, falling towards the black hole, but it's not, it's not the black hole itself. The black hole itself is impossible to, to observe, uh, at least in this kind of uh, settings. You're not going to observe directly the black hole. Uh, there is some, actually, I, I forgot to mention at some point that there is uh, actually a campaign to observe uh, the shadow of the black hole in the center of our galaxy, which is called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a network of, of uh, telescope around the, around the, the, the globe. <laughs> and uh, they hope that they will observe the, the shadow of the black hole uh, because if you have gas behind the black hole and it's emitting some light, then uh, you, the, 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 the emi this emission is going to go through the black hole, it's going to be deflected, and it's going to produce a, a shadow. Uh, but this is extremely difficult to observe because you have to resolve a very, very small uh, region in the galaxy. Uh, actually, to observe the stars that uh, I, met, uh, I showed in this animation, uh, they needed to use this adaptive optics uh, te technique to to correct for the basically for the uh, effects that the atmosphere uh, produces in the light. So you basically it uh, uh, like diffuses some of the effects from the light. So if you need, you want to resolve very very small. Uh, you, you, if you want to achieve a very high resolution, you need to correct for these effects. And that happens in the, the galactic center because you are trying to resolve a very, very small region in the galaxy. And so even though the, this black hole is, uh, is in our backyard, it's extremely hard to observe. So, but, but hopefully soon this, uh, uh, this campaign is going to be successful and we will, for the first time, directly kind of observe the shadow of the of the black hole. Uh, I think that's it with the slide. If you go to the next one. Uh, so this binary stage, it's really important because, of course, it's not the same if you have one black hole uh, heating up the galaxy that if you have two black holes separately. And these objects have very, uh, as I said, showed before very important role in galaxy evolution. So we this binary stage is very important to study. It's gonna tell tell us a lot about the different stages of not only formation of galaxies, but also the formation of these black holes, these supermassive black holes, which by the way, I forgot to mention, we don't really know how they form. Uh, we have several scenarios uh, involving, for example, very early massive stars that uh, collapse into uh, like hundred solar masses black holes, but that poses the problem that they need to be accreting like crazy their whole life in order to produce the black holes that we observe today, uh, the, the ones that we observe very, very far at, at high reaches, reaches. We need, if they are produced by these uh, primordial stars, we need to, uh, they need to accrete a lot like crazy, like at the maximum level, uh, that which is called the Eddington luminous, the Eddington accretion rate, basically the the, the exact exact uh, amount of matter that is needed to, to stop the actual accretion. Because if, as you accrete, you produce energy, and that energy blows up the material. So uh, there is a critical value at which you blow all the material away. So you stop accreting. That's called the Eddington accretion rate. So in order to produce the black holes that we observe very far, so very early in the universe, they need to accrete like crazy 
throughout the whole life. And that's kind of, that is not very plausible. And the other scenario is I think called direct collapse, in which you have a very large uh, cloud of material that the, that the name says it just directly collapses into a black hole. Uh, but basically we don't have any constraint on those scenarios. And of course it can be something else. We, uh, we have these two hypotheses, but it can be something even more uh, exotic. Uh, is there any uh, upper limit important. on that? On the sides of black holes, is there any upper happen? limit? Because, well, I mean, like, like, it, it, like White Dwarf would have the Schwarzschild limits. Uh, neutron star has a Chandeskar mm -hmm. limit. Uh, uh, neutron stars has a TOV limit. Is there any limit on the the size of a black hole? I mean, it can, how how big can a supermassive black hole get? I would say not that we know of. That uh, we have ob observed very, very massive black holes, like ten to the ten solar masses. I don't know how to say so that. What happens if the universe just became one big black hole? That that can happen, uh, but the, well, it's not. No. That can happen in a different universe where you don't have uh, the cosmological constant pushing everything away. But it can happen. Uh, you can have a black hole of the size of the whole universe. Wow, that'd be a pretty um, massive black hole. Yeah, we, I, I don't think there is a limit. Well, it might be. We, we describe black holes with general relativity and general relativity, we know it's wrong at some point. Now, could, we, could some might, people say that might. we're inside a black hole? I mean, we obviously have our own cosmic event horizon, some point that which no light can ever from there reach us and no light from us can ever get out of there. I mean, yeah. because we, of expansion of space-time. So in well. some ways, are we inside a black hole? We might as well, yes. <laughs> There's an yeah, analogy probably. there, right? I mean, somebody, if somebody's from the outside looking in, yeah, yeah. they're not going to see us, right? They can't ever see yeah, us. But I don't think it's actually a, a necessarily a black hole because, yeah, the, basically the geometry of this, the, the, the universe is more or less flat. And in a black hole, you have a very extreme curvature. So I, I don't think you can describe the, the universe as a, like the interior of a black hole. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good analogy. Uh, so yeah, coming, coming back to the binary about, state. About 10 minutes left, by the way. Yeah, I think um, I'm finishing up here. Um, okay. This is why bi the binary stage is very important because it's gonna constrain several of the of these possible scenarios of the formation of black holes. And also it's gonna tell you about the uh, history of mergers of galaxies and so on and so forth. You, you have a lot of processes that can be constrained with these binaries. And how can we under, uh, study these binaries? With the future uh, uh, observatories of gravitational waves, like the one that we are planning to send to space, which is called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Observatory, uh, that is basically a extremely long LIGO. Uh, the problem with the LIGO that cannot detect these uh, the events, basically because you need, in order to resolve wavelength, a, a wavelength of, of some, uh, of some of any emission, you need to have a, an observatory that is uh, at least uh, of the size of the wavelength that you're trying to resolve. If you have, if you're trying to, uh, to study longer wavelengths, you are not going to be able to do it with a smaller, with a smaller observatory. Uh, and the frequency of these events is proportional to the mass, basically the mass of the of the two objects, because the frequency of the the wave, the gravitational wave, is is related to the orbital frequency. So that's uh, in a way proportional to the mass of the system. So we so can tell can by the, only the frequency. We can look at the frequency and see. The, not only the the mass of the object, but what about the object? Because the amplitude tells you the we, size of how much energy is in, this, in that, right? But it doesn't. Yeah, it tells you can, what the original mass was too by by looking at the waveform. Yeah, the waveform tells you the the mass of the two objects, uh, because you yeah you can basically know at what separation they both are, mm -hmm. and because you have what is called the chirp mass. So the chirp is when you have this whoop in the, so increase in, in amplitude and frequency that happens in the, in, the, in the gravitational wave event. 
during the merger. So you have and the form, the, the, the sorry, the shape of that of that share is related to the to the total mass of the of the remnant of the, the final product of this merger. And so that's and why that's what you can constrain like, right? the total. That chirp is actually what you hear. Well, if you, com if you convert, convert it to the frequency, audio. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's if you convert it to audio, you you hear like this chirp, uh, and that constrains the the mass of the of the two objects basically, and the, the mass of the of the resulting object, final object. And it's the same with the um, uh, with uh, higher mass objects, supermassive black holes. And uh, the problem with LIGO is that the, the, even though the, 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 the arm is really long, it's four kilometers, uh, we are basically limited by the size of the, the size and shape of the Earth, so the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> and it's not flat, to the surprise of no one but <laughs> flat earthers who still can't figure that out. <laughs> yeah, it's trying to right. throw some jabs. But yeah, the, basically because we are limited to this very small Earth, we need to produce something with longer arms, and that this is this is uh, LISA, the or LISA. Uh, the observatory is depicted here. It's basically three satellites, in which they produce these uh, very high po high power lasers, and the, the the size of the arms is the order of the the distance of the the Earth to the Sun. So hundreds of uh, hundreds of millions of kilometers? Well, doesn't really matter. It's pretty, pretty, very, very long arms. Like, uh, yeah. and, be, and because you need very long arms to detect the higher wavelengths of these events, uh, of this merger of two supermassive uh, black hole binaries. And that this is coming in the not near so by future, very, very, like 2000. They have to be very far away for very low frequency, high wavelength. Exactly. And with that, we can observe the middle end of the of the massive black hole binaries. So to 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 solar masses, uh, roughly. But for, uh, for even higher masses, you need something even longer. And that uh, it's going to be what is called the pulsar timing array. So if you go to the next slide, uh, which is uh, the, these pulsar timing arrays are basically, this is something that is being developed now. Uh, they use uh, an array of pulsars, so uh, neutron stars that uh, rotate very fast. And because you have emission uh, very collimated, uh, they act like a, like a lighthouse. Basically, you, you observe these uh, pulses of light that are extremely uh, well defined you can measure with very high precision the this uh, the, the pulsation of this uh, of this pulsar so if you monitor uh, a whole array of, of these pulsars uh, you can theoretically measure when a, um, uh, a gravitational wave is passing through uh, let's say in between the pulsars and the earth so and you have very 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 long arms. Now we are talking about uh, uh, millions of uh, sorry the, the other of uh, light years, millions of kilometers, and that is going to be able to detect the higher end of uh, uh, the merger of supermassive black holes. So the ten to the nine, ten to the ten uh, solar masses objects. Uh, and I think the uh, next slide is basically my last one. Uh, but even though in the future we will probably, ah, this is just, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this one. It's just uh, the different regimes at which we observe with the different observatories. So at, at the higher frequencies, we have the LIGO. In the middle, we have the, the uh, LISA. And at the lower end, you have uh, this pulsar time in arrays. This this black line is just the uh, expected uh, performance of the of these different observatories. Uh, so as we, we improve our technology, as we improve the observations, we'll be able to see a lot more events. Other than like the smaller events, we'll be able to see more massive events and therefore be able to study them in more detail. Right. Uh huh. 
exactly. Uh, at least with uh, with pulsar timing arrays, you need uh, radio telescopes that have very high precision, and you need to in order to decrease the the sensitivity of this of this metal, uh, because the, this is something that we can do now, but it's, it, the sensitivity is not uh, high enough in order to detect these kind of events. Uh, so far, it's been only being capable to just constrain the the population of black holes close by. So we know that there is no mergers of 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole up to one megaparsec or something like that. Uh, because we, if not, we will uh, we will able to uh, to observe them with uh, pulsar time arrays. But we need, yeah, to continue improving these observatories and uh, in order to to finally observe this. I think the the first thing that's going to be uh, su successful is probably LICE Lisa, because this uh, at least the technology uh, it's been uh, developed right now and it's been successful. The Lisa Pathfinder was launched in 2016, I think, or something like that. That was like a small smaller version of uh, Lisa. Uh, in order to to test if the uh, the let's say the method was reliable enough to detect these kind of things, and it was extremely successful. So we think that's going to be in, in, at the moment when we launch that, that it's going to be like in 2030 or something like that. Uh, it's going to very likely detect a lot of these events. And yeah, this is the, just the final part of uh, what I wanted to say. So in the future, we're going to detect this, uh, this event, this merger of uh, black holes. But it is very important. No, no, don't go to the other slide. Still in the one. Yeah. So the interaction with the gas is still very important. And this is something that, uh, because we don't basically not really observe with detail these binaries, we need to, uh, to use theoretical methods, basically simulations, numerical simulations. These are all images from different uh, hydrodynamical simulations. And this is just gas around uh, the, the two black holes. So in different configurations. And this gas not only can produce uh, uh, the energy needed to, to uh, power these uh, this, uh, active galaxies that we observe in the universe, but also to actually uh, evolve the orbit of the of the of the binary itself and also at the moment of merger if there is some residual gas around each black hole that can produce some observational signature that can be used to uh, to localize because this uh, even at full capacity this probably this uh, all these um, these methods to observe these binaries are going to be uh, extremely poor to locate in the sky these events but if you have the electromagnetic signature that comes with from gas, the you you are going to be able to to locate those events and also further characterize the the things that were happening. Sometimes you uh, with the waveforms you just can uh, put some constraints in, for example, the spin of the black holes or the orientation of the orbit and so on. And with gas, you can further constrain and characterize these different features. Uh, so that's basically what I do, and the last thing that I wanted to show, but it was an animation. I think if there's still time, I can send the link of one of the animations of my simulations, or if not, I can leave it. We can, we can put it in the video description. Okay. You can definitely put it. In yeah. There. And basically, what, what I do, I just wanted to say what I do. I, well, I use numerical simulations to to study the the evolution of gas. Uh, as it falls to, the, to these binaries and forms different structures. Uh, I am working under the hypo hypothesis that the gas can clump and form the, basically gas clouds that fall towards these binaries. Uh, so my thesis is called infalling clouds into supermassive black hole binaries because I'm, I'm modeling the infall of these uh, different clouds with different orientation, orientations and how they form disks and how this also impacts the the binary orbit and, and so on and so forth. And this is uh, what I've been doing at least during my uh, during my PhD thesis. And I'm actually pretty interested. Um, 
because I, I mean that you have been doing this because this is kind of like what I would like to have done when I was growing up. Um, my fascination with black holes. So I got to tell you, I'm a little green with envy. Just uh, FYI, you you can you can say it. Stay. Uh, I you know what I've been so out of physics for years I don't even remember even half the crap that I ever learned. I, so I, can, I find I it fascinating. I love this stuff. I would all oh, see. Yeah, I see that. I would love to do the simulations. I mean, I just find it fascinating. Like this is what the computer says it should be based upon what we know about laws of physics, and yet we have to go look for it. And when we find it, it's like wow, we we nailed this, right? So I think it's amazing that we can actually model something and actually find some reality that matches our expectations. That's that's science. Yeah, science. It works. <laughs> It works, bitches. So, anyways, Doctor Goitz, I, um, I appreciate it immensely. Do you want to wrap up with anything? Any last words? No, no. Just thank you for having me, and I, I really like to to explain these things to people. So, I, I hope. I, and we love listening. I wasn't. I, I didn't want very. I didn't want to be very boring, so I, I tried to make it like. No, it was a great. Bit more, I, I, well, and look, it, I love it. The people in the live chat. Dave likes it. This is. This is this is awesome for us. We love when people Ky come in. Kyle in. says Kyle says Felipe is muy guapo. So <laughs> <laughs> Yo tengo gato in mi pantalones. Um, yeah, yes. our Spanish sucks in America. By the way, we don't speak it very well. Um, I know. But anyways, just to let you know, we have uh, we have Pac uh, excuse me, we have uh, David Pacman tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be at five o'clock Eastern. Um, and then right after this show, in about a half hour, I'm going to be on fully deconverted. And they're going to be interviewing me. I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. And if you're interested, the link is going to be in the live chat. I just put it out there. And you can come watch that in about a half hour from now. They're going to be sending me the link in about 15 minutes. So i got to wrap it up. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody who watched today. Uh, leave comments in the video description. Let us know what you think about these types of presentations. If you got questions, ask. And maybe we can get them to Dr. Gojkovic. And he can kind of ask or answer, answer them on his own time. But with that, um, I'm going to bid you good night. And see you on the uh, Fully Deconverted episode in about... 45 minutes from now. Good night. Good night. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated.